Good morning, Bethany First Church. We'd like to stand to your feet this morning as we give God all the praise that he deserves. Come on, let's sing together. When all I see is the battle. When all I see is the battle. You see my victory. our God. Amen. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Oh, let's sing it out, church. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands. High. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, and I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? that you're here this morning, whether you're in the room today or whether you're worshiping online with us, it's so good to have you with us. This morning, we want to reach out and connect with you. So if you're new 
to BFC. There's a connect card underneath the armrest of your chair. Take that out, fill it out, pass it in. We'd love to learn more about you. And if you're online this morning, there's a QR code for us to learn more about you. The psalmist invites us to worship. He says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Let's give him all the praise that we have today. All the worship, for he is deserving of it. Amen. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late. Is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, Just a 
bow down before your throne see your face i'll cry out because you're holy 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 are you Lord. jesus king of kings jesus Yeah.
Feel free to have a seat if you like. Thankful for this opportunity to worship with you. And I'm also thankful for an opportunity to introduce you to Jalea Martin. Jalea is a student at Southern Nazarene University. And Jalea is also serving as an intern at our Two Lakes congregation. And Jalea is standing beside me today because she believes that God is calling her into ministry as a vocation. And so today I have the opportunity of presenting Jalea with a local minister's license. So Jalea, we're saying to you today that we see the gifts and graces for ministry in you. We believe that God has put a calling on your life, and we believe that God wants to use you in a powerful way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. We're going to stand beside you. We're going to love on you. We're going to hold you accountable. We're going to try to guide you the best way we can, but we want to be a part of your journey in ministry, okay? And I want to take a minute to pray for you before you walk away, all right? So Lord, today I am grateful for Julia. I love her story. You blessed her by giving her a good Christian mother, and you allowed her to be raised in a Christian home. And Jalea continued to grow in her relationship and her journey with you. And she's come to a place, Lord, not only believing that you've called her to ministry, but she has said yes to this calling. And so, Lord, you may not be calling everybody here to vocational ministry, but you're calling all of us to ministry. We are all called, every one of us. And you want to use every one of us in a powerful way to establish your kingdom on earth. And so there may be somebody in the room that feels a call to vocational ministry, but it could be that others are just realizing in this moment, God, you're calling me to make a difference in my world, in the workplace that I'm in, or in the school that I go to, and help us with Julia to say, yes, Lord, I will answer yes to the call that you've placed on my life. I'll be who you want me to be. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. God, I am yours for whatever purpose you desire. And all the people of God said together, amen. Amen. Great. Okay. All right. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi and he kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. So I think I just need to say, before I say anything else, how about those Bethany Bronco girls, huh? <laughs> State champs. Eric and Amy Saylor are a part of our church, the coach, and uh, we're celebrating with them great. Every Sunday morning, I come downstairs uh, to, to get ready for, you know, um, church. And Annette, my wife, usually asks me, so, you know, how are you doing? How do you feel about the sermon? Do you feel ready? And, and often I'll say to her, you know, boy, God's going to have to help me today. Um, in fact, I probably say that every week. So today she gave me some advice. She said, here, look at me. Just don't try to be funny. Don't try to be witty and don't try to sound intelligent. Just be yourself. Yeah, yeah. So appreciate all of Annette's encouragement this morning. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is a, a tough story that you just heard. I have a friend back in seminary. His name is Steve. We all had to have part-time jobs to make it, going to school full-time. Some of us were married, some weren't. I first had a job working as a bank teller, then I got a job working in a vacuum cleaner store. He got a job driving a delivery truck. So he says one day he's in Kansas City, 
he's driving his delivery, and there's this car behind him that keeps honking, honking. The guy's got his arm out the window waving, like, pull over, pull over. Finally, he thinks that maybe something's wrong with the, the, the delivery truck, and so he pulls over. The, the guy comes up to greet him. When he opens the door to get out of the truck, the guy hits him. And he's like, what, wh why did you hit me? And he said, because you cut me off back there. So this is, you know, 35 years ago, road rage was a real thing then. And he says, I didn't cut you off back there. I wouldn't do that. I'm a Christian. And the guy says to Steve, wait a minute, you're a Christian because I'm a Christian. And Steve says, no, you're not a Christian. If you were a Christian, you wouldn't have hit me. So I wonder if you've ever had a moment in your life where you would say, I don't think I represented Christ very well. I don't think I responded in that situation like a Christ follower should respond. Now, now, while I would tell you that I've had those times in my life, overall, though, would you say that, that I try hard and, and I pray for grace and, and most of the time, when I'm either mistreated or when I feel threatened or when somebody is unkind to me, I think most of the time I respond as Jesus would have me respond and as Jesus would respond. I hope that's your story. Um, we're in the season of Lent, and we're focused on the sacrifice and the suffering of Jesus. And I've challenged you over and over again, don't, don't just... Don't just read the Gospels to, uh, to try to listen to what Jesus said, which that's very important what he said. But also try to read between the lines and, and understand how Jesus lived his life and how Jesus responded to people that mistreated him in this series and maybe how they, they, they were unkind to him. So I'm going to give you a name, okay? And after I give you the name, then you just tell me the first word that comes to your mind. You ready? We'll do it in unison too. So I'll say the name and then I'll give you a signal and you just shout out whatever word comes to your mind really loud. You ready? Okay, here we go. Here's the name and you shout out whatever word comes to your mind. Ready? Judas. Oh, I heard betrayal a lot. Yeah. That's what I think about. How would you like to be the person who is known for betraying somebody? Every time your name comes up in history, oh, yeah, betrayer, yeah. I mean, we got a lot of other words we could attach like villain or hypocrite. Or if you just look at the Scripture, you would have to call him a thief, according to the Scripture. Or greedy, but betrayer. And so if you look up the word betray in the dictionary, it would say uh, something like this, someone who gives information to an enemy. And so that's what G Judas did for 30 pieces of silver. And there's an image hanging over my head today. And we'll let you take a copy of that home with you. But I hope that image is burned in your mind. And I hope it takes on new meaning for you today. Have you ever felt betrayed? How many of you would say, hey, um, someone who I'd entrusted some information to shared that information with someone else. And I felt really betrayed by that person. And when you felt betrayed, how did you handle it? Would you say, oh, I was a champ, Rick. I, I, I did it just like Jesus would have done. Or would you say, I don't, I don't know how well I did. So this is one of those times where you pull up a seat and you say, I think as a family, church family, we need to have a conversation. And that's one of those moments. And, and here's what the conversation is about. We, we live in a world with rising hostility toward Christians these days. Have you noticed it? It's different. When I was a kid growing up in a small Kentucky town, people were per pretty tolerant of Christians. And in fact, I think the overall idea of society was Christians, you know, help create a nice society. They didn't schedule sporting events on Sunday morning because they said, no, no, that's when the Christians worship, and so we're not going to schedule things on Sunday morning because we want to protect that for the Christians. And so society was kind of making allowances for us. And, and for the most part, people believed in the basic tenets of the gospel. And for the most part, society kind of paid attention to the ethics of the Judeo-Christian you know, belief system. But it's not that way anymore. 
It's, it's not uncommon for me to hear someone in media say that Christians are a threat to their way of life. Or on occasion, I'll hear people refer to Christians as dangerous. And so there's a shift. It's a very unfortunate shift. It's a very sad thing. It's sad reality, but it's true. Something has changed in our society. And, and it's like in these last few years, it's like just put the, the, the pedal to the floor. It is speeded up with great acceleration. So not only is it changing, and are we being pushed at times in a corner? You ready for this? Society is watching with open eyes to see how we respond. I learn a lot about people in the way they respond when they feel they've been mistreated. And so the question is, and the heart of the conversation this morning is this, do Christians respond differently when threatened or mistreated? Well, differently from who? Well, everybody else, people who don't claim to be Christian. I mean, mean, do Christians respond in a different way than everybody else responds when we feel threatened or we feel like somebody has mistreated us? I mean, how different are we? When people hang around us, are they saying there's something different? I I don't know what it is, but I'm just telling you, they're very different. They're not like everybody else. It's like these people that go to that church, they march to a different drumbeat. They think differently. They act differently. And, And when they are mistreated or when they feel threatened, They don't respond like everybody else. They have a totally different response than everybody else. And so that takes us to the passage today. Matthew 26, if you want to open your Bible, or we'll put the words on the screen for you as well, okay? Beginning with verse 14. We're in this story of the last hours of Jesus' life, and it says, then one of the 12, meaning 12 disciples of Jesus, the one called Judas Iscariot. Now, Iscariot really refers to where he's from. Kerioth, it's a Judean village. So he is a Judean. He was from the region of Judea. The other disciples were from the region of Galilee, north of that. He went to the chief priest and he asked them, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? In other words, if I'm willing to betray Jesus, I know that you don't want him in the daylight when there's a lot of crowds around, you're worried about a mob. I'll make a deal with you. I'll give him to you at night. I'll tell you where he's going to be. And so they counted out 30 pieces of silver. We don't know the exact uh, value of the coin, but the best that we can assume, we think it's about four months' wages. So if you take what you make in a four-month period of time, that's about what Jesus sold Jesus for. And then from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. I made a deal. I'll keep my end of the deal. And and then when we move on to the Last Supper, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And and while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Now think about this. All the way on the journey to Jerusalem, Jesus has been saying, I will be betrayed. All right? This is the first time he said, it's one of you. So this is new news. Well, you can imagine what they felt. They were very sad. They begin to say to him, one after another, surely you don't mean me, Lord. I mean, this is unthinkable. I would never do this to you. I would never, I would never betray you. And obviously, Judas had covered his tracks pretty good because nobody suspected him. And Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me will betray me. Now, that's not a very good clue because they're probably all dipping into the common bowl at this time. And then he says, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. This is Matthew saying over and over again in this passion narrative that this is part of the divine plan. This is not a false prophet being killed. He is the Messiah, but this is part of God's plan. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. What do you mean woe? He says, this is what I mean. It would be better for him if he had never been born. 
Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. He doesn't call him Lord. He calls him Rabbi. And the reason he doesn't call him Lord is because he's not his Lord. And Jesus answered, You have said so. In other words, You've said it, Judas. I have no more I need to say. By your own mouth, you've admitted your guilt. And now they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. After they leave the Last Supper, they go to the Garden. And while he was still speaking, meaning Jesus, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs. It tells us there were probably Roman soldiers who were authorized to carry swords in that crowd and probably members of the Sanhedrin. They were sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people, meaning this was all the work of religious leaders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. You would arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, again, not Lord, Rabbi. And he kissed him. In Jesus' day, if you kissed someone in public, it was a sign of respect, which makes the act even more hypocritical. Jesus replied, do what you came for. And what does he call him? Friend. And then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. So this is God's word for us today. Annette and I were out of town this past week for a few days, and on Friday morning, I get information that a lady who has been a part of this church for so many, many years, most of her life, Sherry Gilliland, had passed away. So Sherry was the daughter of Ponder Gilliland. Avery is a part of this family. Ponder Gilliland was the pastor of this church for 15 years. From 1970 to 1985. Let me ask you to raise your hand really high if you attended this church when Ponder Gilliland was here. Oh, there's several. I'm surprised. First service, it was just a mass of people. So from 1970 to 1985, he was the pastor of the church, and he did a television show that broadcast locally here in Oklahoma City. And he would say, if I lived in the greater Oklahoma City area, I would attend Bethany First Church of the Nazarene. Crucial to his television ministry was Sherry because she had a gift that God had given her in a voice. And she and her friends would sing on the television show and she would sing here at church and people would actually come to this church because of the incredible music of Sherry and her friends. So in early June, there's going to be a memorial service for Sherry. And I can tell you what they're going to say at the memorial service. They're going to talk about her singing, and they're going to talk about her commitment to Jesus and ministry, but they're going to say things like this, Sherry is with the Lord. Sherry has finally received the reward that she's lived for all of her life. They're going to say things like, Sherry is now in heaven. And the reason we church people talk like that is not because we believe that heaven and hell are places that you are sent when you die. It's because we believe that they are places you have been going all along. And at some point, you simply arrive. In other words, Sherry chose a path for her life. Sherry said, this is the direction I'm going. I'm, 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 going, I'm going with Jesus. I'm going to live my life for him. I'm going to honor him. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to use my gifts for him. This is the path that I've chosen. And you know what? I always end up where the road that I've chosen takes me. I preached a sermon series years ago called The Path. And we just talked about the direction we choose determines our destination. It's really simple. Everybody in this room this morning, so I'm talking to you, you have chosen a path. You're on it right now. And it has a very predictable destination. Setting right where you are right now, you can say to me, I know where this is going to end up. I know where this is going to take me. I've made choices. 
I'm on a path, and I know where the path leads me. There are no exceptions to that this morning. Everybody in the room has made a choice. You've chosen a path, and you know where that path is going to take you. Guess who else chose a path? Judas. So you got to get this picture, okay? One day, Jesus looked into Judas' eyes and he said, hey, come on, come with me, follow me. Can you imagine <laughs> Jesus? Locks eyes with you and says, come on, go with me, come on, I want you, I want you, to come on. He's named an apostle. Think about how many sermons he hears. Thinks about how many times he listened to Jesus teach. Think about how many miracles he witnessed. Right? I mean, but what do we know about Judas through the Scripture? He wasn't a believer. <laughs> what? What do you mean he wasn't a believer? I mean, that's what the Bible says. He, he did not believe. He never came to this place of putting his trust in Jesus. Let me show you. In John chapter 6, verse 64, yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. From the very beginning, Jesus knew Judas, not a believer. Jesus had known from the very beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. I, I, I know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, I'm saying, how, how in the world? What do you mean? He never aligned with Christ? Is that what it's saying? Or is it saying that, that some didn't believe and, and, and then Judas, he, he, he later decided to betray? What, 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 what's the story here? Let me, let me see if I can dig down just a little, a little bit deeper for you, okay? Um, when you look at Jesus' words, Jesus says, one of you is the devil. I've chosen 12, but one of you is the devil. He's talking about Judas. He says, one of you is doomed to destruction. He doesn't mean that before you're ever born, you were doomed. He means because of the path that you've chosen, it's going to take you to destruction. He never called me Lord. He only called me Rabbi. And so every time, every time I feel like that I try to talk about Judas, it's like all these unanswered questions. And, and I think it's way more simple than we've made it. I, I think it's simply that Judas chose a path. And we always end up where the road that we've chosen takes us. And one day he arrived. And so Judas didn't respond when tension came, when the pressure came, when the crowds came after Jesus. He didn't respond like a follower of Jesus because he didn't believe. He wasn't a follower of Jesus. Let me, let me take you one step closer. There's a story in, in the Bible just before the scripture I read to you, Matthew 26, earlier in the chapter, it's Holy Week. Jesus is in Bethany. He's at a home of a man named Simon the leper. You remember the story? Do you know what happens at the home of Simon the leper? A lady is there. We don't get her name, not from Matthew. And she has a jar, an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. And she takes this jar a very expensive perfume, and, and she pours it out over on Jesus. And Matthew says some disciples were concerned about that because they said, why would you waste it? Why wouldn't you just sell it and give the money to the poor? And Jesus challenged them and said, you, you don't understand what is happening here. She is preparing me for my burial. But John gives us a lot more detail about the story. In chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, here's what he says. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He didn't say this 
because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. You might be with me right now because I'm saying, what? This guy got to hang out with Jesus, God in the flesh, right? I mean, he listened to him preach and teach, and yet, and yet, and yet he, he's a thief. <laughs> he, he's like a fake. He appears to be a disciple, but he's not. He appears to follow Jesus, but he doesn't. It was, it was all like a hoax. He was a, he was a hypocrite. Does he realize what kind of a gift he was given? Do you and I realize what kind of a gift we've been given? To have heard the gospel? To have seen God's hand at work in our lives? For God to draw us to himself. Do do we realize the gift we've been given? So let me let me just try my best to start a conversation with you that will help us kind of move through the next section of this story. So what we see is a picture of the kingdom of God here with this upside down kind of thinking. It's just, we're different. We march to a different drumbeat. You're, you're not citizens of this world. You're citizens of God's kingdom when you come to know Jesus. And, and the value system is so different. We value things that the kingdoms of this world do not value. We, we, we live differently, right? So, so the lady, she takes this expensive perfume and she gives it away. And, and in return, she gains everything. Judas takes the silver for himself and loses everything. In the kingdom of God, you only save what you give away. I know, isn't it crazy? It's hard to wrap your head around it, and it's harder to wrap your heart around it, right? You only save the things you give away. If you want to save something, yeah, give it away. You want to be first? Yeah, go back to the go to the back of the line. You want to be great? I want to be great. Okay, then become a servant. It's this other way to think about life. So, when I was a college student between my junior and senior year, I worked at a church in southern Georgia. Their accents in southern Georgia are very strong. I said to the pastor, "How long have you been a pastor?" He said, Forty-four years. I, I remember one day, I was at the pastor's house, and his wife came home from a baby shower. And she said, you wouldn't believe who was there. And he said, who? And then she says this lady's name. Well, I don't know the lady or the story. And they tell me what had happened, that this lady was a very contrary person to deal with. She was very unkind. She was downright mean at times. She attended their church. She made life hard. She was divisive. She said awful things about them. And they had not seen her for a couple of years since she had quit attending their church. And he says to her, Miss Doris, what did you do when you saw her? And she stood there in the kitchen and her eyes swelled up with tears. And she said, I loved her neck. That's a Georgia talk for I gave her a hug. That's what they used to say to me. Come here, boy, and let me love your neck. Let me, let me say it another way. If you were going to have a, a dinner and cook your, you know, the foods that you're best at, okay? So like Annette and I, we're having dinner at our house tonight. We're having a small group. We're going to sit around our dining room table. We're going to talk and laugh. It's going to be great. We're looking forward to it. If you were going to have a meal like that, who would you invite? You just want to have some folks over. You want to have a good time, right? 
Jesus invited Judas. See? <laughs> See what I mean? I'm like, I don't want to invite Judas. Judas betrayed me. I don't want anything to do with Judas. See, that's that kingdom of God kind of thinking. It's, yeah, we're odd. We're different. We do those kinds of things. We got an enemy. What do we do? We try to restore the relationship. Never once does Jesus speak to Judas with animosity. Never once does Judas, Jesus unkind to Judas. He calls him a friend. Jesus responded to his betrayer with love and compassion. So we started this conversation by saying the world is a little more hostile right now toward Christians than we've ever experienced in our lifetime. So how are we responding to that? I mean, I think the temptation is to say, let's just circle the wagons, okay? Let's just pray the Calvary comes over the hill anytime and rescues us. Seriously, I mean, I think the temptation for the church is to say, let's just hunker down and hope Jesus comes really soon because it's getting weird. I mean, isn't the boat always safer in the harbor? But the boat wasn't built for the harbor. The boat was built for the open sea. And the Christian was not called to hunker down. This is our moment. This is when we stand up. This is when we rise up. We are people with the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We don't back down. We don't quit the game. This is when we shine. You say, but Rick, how do you share Jesus with a world that sees us as the enemy and the threat? I think we seek to become more like Jesus. And I think Peter had it in his heart when he said, live such good lives. What do you do? You live such good lives. I mean, I mean you live such good lives among the pagans. And this is not being unkind. He's just talking about people who don't know Jesus. Among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds because you're living good lives and you have these good deeds. And in result, they glorify God. In other words, you respond like Jesus responds. I'm, I'm, I'm a mess in my heart many days. I just think, what, what, what do we do? The world's, the world's going the wrong direction. Do we just let it go? Just stand aside and say, well, they, there the world went in the wrong direction. I, I don't have it all figured out, but I know this. Whatever we do, however we respond, people must see the love and the compassion of Jesus in us. So would you bow your heads with me? And could we just take a moment to pray? And could you do a little soul searching? Could we start here and just say, Lord, you know the path that I've chosen. Let me be honest with you about the path that I've chosen. And let me just take a moment to admit to myself where this path is going to take me. And, and, and then could we just take a moment to say, I know the world is watching me. The people at my work, people at my school, people in my neighborhood, the people that I meet through the activities in our lives. What are they seeing? God, would you just open my eyes to help me see what they see? Are they seeing Jesus? Am I responding like Jesus would respond?
Father, the only hope, the only hope we have, the only hope we have is to become more like Jesus. The only hope the world has is for us to become more like Jesus. That they would look at our community and say there is something different about them. And that you would put in them a desire to be a part of a community like this. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
has put a calling on all of our lives, and we've heard about that calling today. Thank you, Pastor, for your great words today and sharing with what the Lord would have you to share today. And in that calling, we respond. We have the choice to respond, right? And we respond with a surrendered heart to all that God has us to do. And as we leave this place today and we go out into the world, we have the opportunity to respond with that love and compassion that Pastor talked about today. And as you leave this place today, there'll be a card, much like you received last week if you were here, with the image on it, just to remind you of what we've talked about this week, the scripture references, reflection questions, things to, that you can ponder about this week and reflect on what, we, what was shared today. This is a good day, and we thank you so much for your faithfulness as you continue to give to the church. As always, so welcome. And as you continue to be faithful and God blesses you in that, we're so grateful uh, through the ministry of this church here and far beyond. So as you leave today, remember, respond with the love and compassion that God has shown each of us. Thank you for coming today. You are dismissed.